Um, yeah. Okay, so so my clock does now say that we're at 10 o'clock. So why don't I kick things off by saying good evening, everyone, or good afternoon or good morning, depending on what's appropriate where you are. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be hosting this Ask Me Anything session with Richard P. Gabriel, otherwise known as Dick Gabriel, uh, a man who's very hard to introduce. And uh, he was saying before we started this that, oh, I think maybe not many people know me and... and um, uh, maybe we won't get very many questions. Well, we've got plenty of questions and I'm sure um, some more will roll in, but uh, I would, I, I struggle to summarize uh, um, uh, Dick Gabriel, except to say, well, quoting from the, the blurb we have on the PLDI website, describing him as one of the few genuine Renaissance men to emerge from the PL milieu, scholar, scientist, poet, performance artist, entrepreneur, musician, essayist, and yes, hacker. I believe those words, they're very uh, pleasing to read. So um, we have a 20 minute slot. Uh, I'm happy to overrun that little bit. Dick, how do you feel about overrun? Up to you. Okay, well, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on the time. Uh, and why don't we start with, uh, well, we've got so many questions to choose from, but I'm gonna pick one from James Noble from the University of Wellington. Oh, and I apologize for mispronunciations of various kinds. And James has helpfully given the Maori name for the university, which. I'm not, I'm not going to try to pronounce, but I apologize for not doing so. But James says, you've worked on computational poetry in Lisp. How do you think the results would be different if you used a different language? Well, the, the simple answer to that is, is ridiculously simple, <clears throat> which is uh, I would have produced nothing at all because I'll be honest, Lisp is the only programming language I know well enough to program in. So that's probably not the answer he was looking for. Uh, so what I was trying to do with uh, the computational poetry was to try to write a program that thought about writing poetry the way poets think about writing poetry. So that meant that there had to be a lot of data. There's a little bit of machine learning involved, but there's kind of a degree of consciousness that goes into it. So to, to paraphrase one of the people in the Turing debate back in the 40s, uh, something can't be considered intelligent until it can compose a poem and know that it is composing it and doing it from its own feelings. So the system I wrote uh, called Inkwell uh, uses, it, it generates programs that then generate the poetry. So I'm not sure how easy that would be to do in some of the other languages. So I use a lot of the reflective capabilities. Uh, I, I have written parts that kind of look at the internal data structures and reason about what it's trying to do. So I don't think I could do it otherwise. Plus I don't know any other languages, so. That makes sense. That's a, that is a fascinating, uh, perhaps less obvious uh, uh, way of making use of those reflective abilities of Lisp. That's, that's very interesting. So staying on the same theme while we're here on poetry, uh, John, John Wickerson from Imperial College asks, does being a poet affect how you program? Well, I, I sort of don't really know because I started writing poetry a decent while ago and uh, started writing about um, the, this poetry writing program uh, since being a poet. But I think that the general effect is that I feel more comfortable letting ideas percolate, uh, writing of simple forms, versions of things, and then waiting for the slowly dawning insights to occur to me, uh, starting with simple data structures and then in, you know, refining them over time. Uh, so kind of letting the problem or the mystery come to me rather than me going to the to the problem. So I think uh, just being a little more relaxed about it. Uh, I did have a couple of incidents that uh, audience might be interested in. Uh, when I first started, there was a complicated algorithm that I needed to figure out how to write. And I'm really lousy at algorithms. And one night I had a dream that I had written the program and in the dream, I was looking at the screen and there was the Lisp code. And I knew I was dreaming. And so I kind of somehow said to myself, pay attention to each line of code and try to remember it in your 
more conscious brain. And so the next morning I woke up, I went downstairs, I typed in the code, there's about a hundred lines of code and it worked. So I don't think I could have done that uh, before being a poet. I think that's a brilliant answer, thank you. Um, so why don't we go a little bit back in time um, Sophia Drisopoulou from Imperial, also from Imperial College, um, has an interesting question which we were talking about just before uh, the start of the session actually saying, you've been one of the first people to work on AI, maybe if we go 15 years uh, plus or minus, and at the time uh, the work was driven by programming languages such as Lisp and Prolog. What do you see as the future of AI and will programming languages ever play that kind of central role in, the AI, in AI in future? Uh, so I switched microphones because I saw one of the Slack people said this, there was a lot of noise. So can you hear me a little better? That's much better. Yeah, there's, there was a bit of rumbling, but it seems to have gone away. Okay. Um, so I have a peculiar kind of view on, on AI. So I, I started in AI when it was about more problem solving, uh, more symbolic AI than, than we have today with machine learning. And my, my the program I do now involves some machine learning, but... To me, in the future, the thing I mentioned earlier about consciousness, I think is an important thing. Uh, a, I'm interested in programs that display mind-like capabilities. And that's not just recognizing, you know, donuts and cats and things like that. Um, and so there's a perceptual part to it. There's a heuristic part to it. And then there's kind of the reasoning part of it. So I think in the future, uh, true AI systems, in, in my sense, will have to be a, a hybrids of machine learned and symbolic programming. So we'll need some kind of programming language. Even if you look at the original AlphaGo, uh, it had all this machine learned stuff, but it did Monte Carlo rollout uh, to sort of check on what the, the, the best sort of game strategies were, what, what the real values of the, of the moves were. And that was written, I presume, in a programming language. And also the mechanism for the machine to interact with someone in the world playing was written in a programming language. So I think it'll always be a hybrid. So I think the reliance on pure machine learning, you know, you can argue it philosophically, Whatever symbolic reasoning capability we have obviously is machine learned. And so maybe we'll, you know, you could machine learn a mechanism that could display the symbolic computational part, but I'm not sure we're there quite yet. Okay, great. Um, let's move a little bit more in this programming direction. And uh, I had another question from James Noble earlier, actually. So um, so James asks about IDEs and he says, uh, you once worked on or with IDEs for Lisp, Smalltalk, can't have to tell whether he meant to write et cetera or and C. I don't know whether, which, which is the true completion of that sentence. Anyway, um, have existing commercial IDEs caught up with what you were doing back then? Or do you think there are important things that we're missing? Well, I, I certainly don't like to use the phrase caught up or not caught up. Um, so he's talking about a, a system that I worked on with some folks back in the late 1980s and it was for C and C++. So that was the completion of the, of the sentence that he had. And we had a interesting kind of point of view. And the point of view was we believe that a good IDE, we call them programming environments back then, uh, enable the programmer to really inhabit the code, to be inside of it. And so even though the Lisp guys and Smalltalk guys said, well, the text is not the program, to a lot of people, the text is the program. Yeah. So we wanted all of whatever mechanisms there were to be in the text. So not a side panel or not a tool on the side. We also wanted, or we believe that if you were programming using some compiler, it didn't matter what the standard said. It didn't matter what some code highlighter thought the code should look like. It mattered what the compiler thought was there. So all of the knowledge and the interaction came from 
the tools that were doing the real work. And so that was part of this inhabiting the code that we sort of had. And so if you looked at our system, it had like just one window more or less. We had, you could have as many as you wanted, but, and it was looking at the code and the code would be decorated in various ways with what the different tools like GCC or the, the debugger or other, other tools, the, the programmers were using in their ordinary uh, programming thought about the code. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think people have caught, quote, caught up to the point of view, but I think the, the uh, flashiness of the, of the programming environments now is dramatically better than what we had because I mean, back then X windows was a big deal. Right. So. Um, so I had another thing I'm going to go to next. Oh yeah. Uh, so, so we have another question um, from, we have a question from Robert Chatley, also at Imperial, a bit of an Imperial Bonanza tonight. Uh, and he's referring to uh, the work you, uh, work you've, you've done in the space of patterns and he says are we any closer to figuring out what Alexander's quality without a name might be in the realm of software? Um, so <clears throat> I, I've studied Alexander's work for 30, 35 years and there's the quality without a name, there's wholeness, there's life, uh, there's uh, orderliness, and the thing to keep in mind about Alexander is um, he didn't talk a huge amount about what went into the innards of a program, I'm sorry, of a house, but what it was like to live in the house and how the house sort of related to human activity. So quality without a name, all of those things really should be looked at in terms of the software as people interact with it. So if you want to bring programming languages into the mix, then it has to do with what I just mentioned earlier, which is programmers inhabit their code, they live there. And so there could be a quality of name for the code itself. And uh, I've looked at that, lots of other people have, and, and no real answer has been satisfactory. One thing I will point out, um, I don't want to mess around with the, with the screen, but basically one of Alexander's famous quotes is, nothing that can be considered alive or a living system has ever been made from modular parts. Never been made from modular parts. And so in our you know, software and computer science world, you can't build anything except for from modular parts. So there's kind of a little disconnect with Alexander to begin with. That's a fascinating observation. I have to go away and chew on that one a little while myself. Um, so where are we now? So Sophia uh, Drosopoulou again has another question, which is, I think, uh, a good, uh, good follow-on. Say, what you say about good IDEs reminds me of reflection. Do you think that we know how to do reflection? Should reflection be, for example, as it is in Java or as it is in Smalltalk, or maybe there's something undiscovered? So yeah, I, yes, I'm a big believer in reflection, but that could be from my Lispy background. Um, as I say, the programs that I write now uh, are, are trying to reason about its own activities while it's running. Um, and so if, if someone is doing a project like me, so uh, I'll make a confession. I have never written a program that someone paid for, nor have I written a program that someone other than I used for real work. So I'm not a programmer in the general sense of the word. When I write programs, they're kind of research colleagues. And so I interact with them. Uh, I don't like write them and throw them away or write them and use them for a specific thing, et cetera. So for the bulk of software, probably you don't need as pervasive a reflective system as some of, some of the languages that Sophia mentions. On the other hand, when we have gigantically complex systems, they're gonna to have to have, I believe, 
some degree of what someone might call consciousness so that you can rely on the program knowing that it knows what it's trying to do. I'll give you a trivial example. So uh, in most operating systems, uh, if you have a focus on a window and you start typing, then what you type goes to whatever that window is connected to. If you connect, if you're not connected to where you thought you were and you start typing stuff, then the system will throw away what you've written. It won't say, the guy spent like a minute typing something. I should probably remember that and offer to put it wherever the guy ends up going. So even that small degree of consciousness there would help dramatically. Uh, so, I, so probably consciousness is the underlying point that I'll try to make today. Right. Um, I think that, that segues reasonably well to another question from James, who's asking, uh, this is again, James Noble, Victoria University of Wellington. There seemed to be a tension between patterns, base level programming, such as functions and objects, and meta level programming, such as macros, code generation and reflection, um, and language features such as call CC, algebraic effect handlers, and so on. So do you think this tension would go away with better languages, or is it something that we're stuck with? I think we're stuck with it in, this, in, in the sense of because people think that way, people act that way, that they're going to want to see those sorts of mechanisms in their programming languages. Um, and um, that goes back a little bit to Alexander, where he kind of favored vernacular architecture over heavily designed architecture. So I don't think that we're going to really get away from that. And if you look at my programming, uh, I write some of the biggest macros on the face of the planet. So I'm, I'm writing a macro, not right this very second, but yesterday, that encompasses a couple of thousand lines of code, just to do a simple macro. So, and, so, and that particular macro does things like proposes some code, then the Lisp system will compile it, you know, inside of a, you know, a bomb proof box and see what happened and then reason about what the macro should be to, you know, make the compiler a little bit happier with what's going on and have the compiler tell the system that I'm writing, the macro I'm writing, what it is I should be doing and supply parts to it. So that could be the sign of my age, I suppose, that I, I program like that. So um, speaking of age, I have a question from Ali Donaldson, our illustrious uh, chair, who says, when I read about your background and the relatively early days of programming languages, I feel jealous. It seems that back then there were all sorts of machines made by loads of different companies, each simple enough that you could understand it completely, and programming languages and their features were brand new. Everything was new and exciting. Do you, do you remember it as a golden age? And if so, did it feel like that at the time? Um, so I'll answer the second part of that because otherwise I'm just an old fogey looking back. <laughs> I remember when I first was introduced to programming uh, and went to the MIT AI lab for the very first time. Uh, I had no idea that, that I didn't know what AI was. I didn't know any other language but Fortran because that was part of my, my co-op job at Northeastern University. And I saw the way that the people at MIT had AI problems they wanted to solve. And their first step was to write a programming language to address it. So uh, Conniver, Planner, Microplanner. Uh, you always created a language first. Even at Stan when I got to Stanford, Winograd did KRL. Um, there was common loops. There was flavors. There was all sorts of stuff. And it felt to me then like there's just a lot of interesting stuff happening. And as I've gotten older, that feeling has gone away in that it seems like we're, we're perfecting buggy whips in the computer science world. We've sort of gone down one path and now we're 
slowly improving that what's on that path. And it doesn't feel like a very exciting path to me. Right, I completely sympathize. So we're now at the end of our schedule slot. I would very much like to carry on. I think I'm gonna take a very, just a few seconds pause so that anyone who needs to drain away can do so. And I can try and breathe in a little bit and uh, keep myself awake. Um, and also figure out what question I'm going to ask you next. And feel free to shout if you want to stop at any time because uh, who knows how long we could keep going. Um, I want to thank Ryan Davis for pointing out the microphone problem. Oh yeah, um, that's a very important uh, thing to do. So yes, thank you, Ryan. Looks like he wasn't at Imperial College though. Oh yeah, a, a rare exception. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we go to the question from Justin Slepak from Northeastern and, and Facebook, um, who says, some time ago, you gave a talk, and you also wrote something on your webpage, I remember, uh, uh, describing your idea for a Master of Fine Arts degree in software. So have you thought much about that since then, and is there now any more to that story? So, um, hmm. Yeah, there is more to the story. So uh, I think one of the questions earlier in the Slack channel was uh, about the MFA experience that I had. So the reason that I came up with the idea of MFA of software was when I went back in 1995 to get a degree in writing poetry, I was sh totally shocked by how rigorous and difficult that was. So in my career, I've been, I've been a student at many universities, Northeastern, MIT, University of Illinois, and Stanford. And I went to this small college, Warren Wilson College, for a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry. And it was orders of magnitude harder. So I had to read hundreds of books. So I have a bookshelf upstairs. It's about 15 feet long, eight feet tall. It's full of books. I had to read every one of them. I had to write hundreds of essays. I had to write dozens of poems. I had to write an academic dissertation. And everything I did was observed and critiqued continuously. And I thought, if I looked at a Master of Software Engineering degree, that was like one semester's worth of effort for the MFA in software, uh, MFA in, in poetry. And this is to write poems, which like no one in the world cares about. So it seemed like it would be a much better way to teach people to be very responsible programmers. So I put together the proposal and I presented it to four or five universities and uh, I will summarize uh, by enacting the response that I got. I would go and I'd give a talk that'd be very polite. And then starting right after I left, this is the response I got. Total silence. So uh, this was when, corresponded to when making money at Master of Software Engineering programs became a big thing. And Pete, the, I believe the faculty and the administrators were worried that the uh, instructors couldn't be found to sort of teach the way you had to teach for an MFA in software. So it went absolutely nowhere. Uh, and much to my disappointment, the closest we ever came as it might be, uh, this, uh, I'll leave out the name, a benefactor uh, attempted to buy a college in Santa Fe for another guy and me to do an MFA and an undergraduate of this variety, but he got outbid. Oh. And that was the closest we came. That's such a sad story. Well, the, I, I'm still holding out hope now that some sort of home can be found for this. I, th I think it would be a, a wonderful thing to have happening in the world. So, um, well, 
we will see. But uh, that is a bit sad. Um, so I realized we, I, I thought we'd asked all the questions from the Slack, but we haven't because there's one from Sophia, which is, I think, an important one to go back to, um, where she says she's asking about the, uh, the infamous uh, paper that is known as Worse is Better, although its full title was involved good news, bad news, and how to win, win big. So she, she says, um, you wrote Worse is Better. Do you still support these ideas or do you... Uh, should we now adopt the, what you call the MIT approach, the right thing approach? Do you think that Lisp satisfied the principles that you proposed? And do the current programming languages satisfy these principles or should they? Yeah, so worse is better is um, a way of thinking about how to design things. And so the basic premise behind it is, is kind of the open source premise. Uh, the phrase open source didn't exist at that time. The idea is you start with a nugget of something that seems valuable. And then as the insights occur to you and as the thing is used and you see what it's gonna be used for, the way that it evolves sort of evolves with the, pro the problems that are being solved using whatever it is, if it's a programming language. And so it's kind of like, uh, there's a dichotomy in the art world, experimental versus conceptual art. Experimental art, you have no idea what you're gonna paint or sculpt until you start and you see what emerges. Conceptual art is you sort of picture the thing as best you can, you plan it out beforehand and you either have a clear picture of what it's going to be or a clear picture of how it will be produced and then you produce it. So that's the right thing. Experimental art is, is worse is better. So I think you end up with programming languages and other systems that are more habitable if you kind of start with something small and have it co-evolve with how people come to understand what it will be used for. So I still believe in, in worse is better it's a terrible name, but uh, uh, it's a memorable name. Um, and Worse is Better did actually a lot for my career. It's some of the other questions could, have, could touch on that. Lisp itself, um, kind of an interesting case. Um, so if you look at John McCarthy's Hopple 2 talk on the history of, of Lisp, he says one of the early things he worked on, he was invited uh, to go to an IBM lab somewhere, was symbolic differentiation. He says it was a problem that he decided would help him design Lisp. And so one of the things he said was, so as he was writing prototypes of code, which couldn't run anywhere, that would do symbolic differentiation, he realized that if he did explicit erasure of unused structures, that would make the code look ugly. And that he didn't want to have ugly looking code. He had no idea how to deal with dangling stuff that's not used anymore. And he figured, we'll figure it out later. But basically, he made Lisp a garbage collected language because the code looked better. And so that's an example of kind of starting with an idea, working through it, and then having the thing itself help you design what it is you're trying to design. So uh, as a sort of an aside to Sophia, um, <clears throat> the right thing approach to Lisp was Scheme. And that sort of led to our current functional programming world, which I love those guys. I love what they did, but I hate their languages. <laughs> no offense, uh, uh, Philip. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question from Dave Unger. Dave Unger currently at Apple, if I'm not out of date. He says, uh, he says hi, first of all, and he says, is there a PL researcher personality type? And does that conflict with all of the programmers out there? Well, yeah, so, um, yeah, Dave Unger, good to see he's still uh, hanging in there. 
there's a, I talked a, a minute ago about the, uh, the functional programming people. And the feeling I have, it's not a clear thought. The feeling I have is there's kind of two views of programming that you could have, broadly speaking. One is that, as I mentioned, you inhabit the code, it's alive, it's something you work with, you interact with, you're there inside of it. Uh, you kind of nudge it this way and that way, you look at what it's doing and you, you kind of sort of come to understand the problem or the mystery that you're trying to un unravel that way. The other way is you consider a program to be the text as written on a piece of paper. And everything you can think about by looking at that text on a piece of paper is what, to me, a lot of the programming language researchers have in their heads. The programming is how you reason about text on a piece of paper. And so I think there is a conflict there uh, because the uh, programs as text people seem to have the slightly upper hand these days. The machine learning folks possibly are uh, assaulting that position one way or another. Uh, but yeah, I think <clears throat> there is a little bit of disconnect there. So somewhat on topic, we have a question from Uke Ever Everard from Google. And I think harking back to what you said about the the, the divergence between scheme and and uh, Lisp, perhaps, is uh, he's mentioning Clojure and saying, <clears throat> "What do you think about uh, Clojure as a as a serious Lisp?" Well, I like it well enough. Um, it's a little less uh, habitable to me than than I like Lisps to be. Um, I don't have much of a deep opinion one way or the other. We did have a good closure paper, though, in Hopple. So uh -huh. I uh, encourage the readers to go to the Packham PL site and read Rich Hickey's paper. It's a very good advert. We shouldn't we shouldn't forget those Hopple papers that are now fully available. Um, we have a question from Julia Belyakova from Northeastern, who says, do you have thoughts on how CS education could be made less scary to students from marginalized communities. There seem to be ideas floating around that unless you already know how to program, then a CS major is not for you. Well, I think that um, the, the, uh, one of the big premises behind the MFA in software was to come up with ways to, to make the field more inviting. To, to ordinary people. I'll tell a, a tiny, tiny story about that. So I was quite surprised that I, I got into the MFA program and poetry that I did get into. So I befriended some of the faculty and in particular, some of the faculty who were on the admissions committee. I said, how did you pick which of the thousands of people who applied would get in? And he says, well, we had everyone send in six poems and we would let anyone in who could write one line of poetry out of the six. So you didn't have to be a great poet. You didn't have to sustain it. You just had to show that you had a little bit of the poetic spark and then they'll take it from there. So I think if you didn't have such a sciency based facade, on the front doors of the schools, that would help. And if there were other ways of learning than what we do these days, I think that that would, that would help. So that was, that was the idea was um, to try to enable people who could contribute the opportunity to get as good as they could as researchers or programmers or software engineers or whatever they thought they might want to do. Yep. Uh, speaking of people becoming good, we have Uke uh, Everard again uh, talking about recruiting good developers. He says you recruited J Jamie Zawinski when you were at Lucid. So do you have any tips in general on how to recruit good developers? So Zawinski is uh, the guy who's really behind um, 
why I'm known for worse is better. So you could go to my website and other places, his, his uh, pages and, and read about that. Um, at Lucid and other places where I was in a position to hire people, I would try to see if there was something to them that was beyond the, the technical, technological, mathematical. Um, at my company at Lucid, we had there were three or four working rock and roll bands. We had several uh, uh, classical composers and that, that was not by design. We just looked for people who had, who had, I don't wanna say more to them, but willing to talk about what was more to them than otherwise. We never gave any programming tests or anything like that. And, um, yeah, I, I think that's as, as good as I can get. It's, it's something you just sense about someone. Um, and you can feel when you're talking to someone who's has more to contribute than the number of code characters they can type in per minute. So that feeds another question from Sophia, who says, how would CS education not have a science facade? <sighs> So, 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 Sophia, I try to use the word facade because um, it's the door that you walk through to get to a place that is science oriented uh, can be any sort of door. And I think there are lots of people who, when they see the science facade, say, only someone who is already a scientist can pass through. Now, once you get to the other side, then, well, obviously science is at the heart of it. And you try, you're trying to get people past their fear. You're trying to get them to uh, realize that there are lots of ways to be a good scientist other than the standard kind of nerdish ways we think of it. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, if you, if you have a, a fun house that has a scary facade, that's going to limit who goes through the door. So it's just what the door looks like, not what's inside. That's, a, I like that very much. Um, so I think we've exhausted Slack, um, but I have some questions that I prepared earlier. How do we feel about, and I also get, gathered at least one or two from, uh, from, other uh, colleagues. So how do we feel about a little bit more chat? Sure. Okay, great. Um, so uh, one from our, our colleague, Thomas Petricek at Kent, who says, um, do you view computer science as a scientific discipline that is progressive in the sense that we're gradually acquiring more knowledge and moving forward, perhaps slowly or via useless detours, uh, and if so, does your work contribute to that? Or perhaps we're on the wrong track and your work is more uh, a disruption to push us onto a better one. Yeah, Thomas Petracek is uh, he's probably one of the, to me, he's one of the most interesting guys in our neck of the woods these days. So, um, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, I view a lot of computer science, especially programming language research these days, to be perfecting a buggy whip. So another way to look at it is uh, a lot of good engineering was done in the presence of incorrect scientific theories. So, um, you know, steam engines, lots of things like that were made when the caloric theory of energy was in place. So I think we're progressive in the sense of we are kind of moving forward. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with moving in that direction. I think we should be 
putting some effort into other directions as well. So the dynamic languages, the live languages, uh, the heavily reflective way of looking at things, um, the less strictly mathematical way of looking at things. Uh, I think there's a lot of avenues there. Uh, I think my, so I don't think that anything I've done in my career has contributed to the science of computer science at all. Um, so I don't think I'm disruptive. I don't think I'm not disruptive. I think I'm relatively irrelevant. <laughs> That's a harsh judgment, but <laughs> um, so on the same topic, we just had a question come in from Stefan Ma, also from the University of Kent, um, saying regarding education and poetry, um, Stefan uh, saw a headline recently that said writing skills are a better predictor for the ability to program or learn to program than mathematics skills. So uh, if that's the case, would there be a way forward to make our computing programs more attractive to people who are more interested in writing than they are in mathematics? Well, that's a, a difficult question, and um, rather than completely embarrass myself uh, by trying to answer it directly, I'm going to answer it with a little story. So over the years, I've tried to help, uh, tried to teach people how to write. And I always gave them one particular task to do, and that was really quite simple. So for example, if I was at Lucid, my company in the, in the building, I would say, please write a description that I will follow to go from here to Kepler's bookstore. So Kepler's bookstore is approximately a quarter of a mile away. You have to cross a railroad tracks. You have to go zigzag a couple of streets. And I would say, I'm going to follow your instructions to the letter. And every single one of them would write instructions that would get me nowhere near Kepler's bookstore. <laughs> and so when you're writing, you're concerned with what people might know from their lives, what they know from what you've written, how well you think you've instructed them by your example of writing over how to read what you've written. And you have to keep all of that in mind and then move forward in kind of a linearish way. And to me, that's the essence of programming. You have to keep all of that in mind. What does the computer have in it? What kind of data structures are there? How initialized are they? What stage are we at? Uh, you know, where am I in my nested closures? Where am I in my reflective thinking, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's a strong correlation between good writers and good programmers, but I'm not sure anyone has thought any much more deeply about it than that. So a similar topic, uh, Dave Unger um, continues, why teach computer science stroke programming uh, what are the goals that are important to you? Uh, what are we equipping students to do? What effect would you have them have on the world? What sort of things would you have them build or discover? Well, leave it to Unger to ask a hard question. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Slightly off tan uh, on a tangent, um, I think that programmers, programming language researchers have a pretty strong moral responsibility in what we're doing to the world. Yep. And I think I think we need to have people who want to build software and systems that 
help people that don't break laws, don't kill people, or don't kill people unintentionally, and <clears throat> who can make software that the people who come later can live inside of well. And I don't think we do that. I think we, Part of it is, so I mentioned before, I've never written a program that made any money. When we think about writing applications, I know it's correct to call that programming, but it doesn't feel like programming to me. That feels like we're trying to achieve some effect that doesn't necessarily better the world. And so I don't like the terminology of programmers solve problems, researchers solve problems. To me, the, the interesting thing is mysteries that get unraveled. So that, that's about all I can say to, to Dave. Um, maybe we'll just pick one or two more. I think we, we have run out on the Slack um, <clears throat> and we're close to a point that I think would be good for ending. Um, I wonder if I can pull out one or two more um, to finish us off. Um, so one of the things I, I, this is a question that I sent to you earlier, so um, is, is that you've, over the years, you've carved a very individual path, uh, which is something I definitely admire. And uh, I also find it amazing that you have spent quite large chunks of time working at quite big companies for Sun and for IBM, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, how did that come about? And is, my phrasing was, is that a trick anyone can learn? Uh, I certainly haven't been very good at that sort of thing. So it's a trick that I warn you to not try to do. Um, <laughs> and... It's a relatively difficult thing for me to talk about. So the work I did in Lisp, the fact I had my own company and then culminating in worse and better, worse is better, meant that I got a fairly high degree of notoriety in the computer science world. So on the braggy side, there are articles written about me in, in the Wall Street Journal, uh, I was interviewed by lots of magazines. The Economist did a small article on me, et cetera, et cetera. So I became kind of well-known. And the way that I, I just introduce myself when people want a short introduction is, I'm the world's most famous third-rate computer scientist. <laughs> so I gained a lot of notoriety. And so for some of those big companies, I was a trophy hire. Well, so they so they would hire me and say, we have hired Dick Gabriel. And so at least for a while, I would pay attention to what they did. But eventually, some bright, shiny object, some idea, some interest would occur to me, and I would just go work on that. And then at that point, I would no longer be working for them. <laughs> so the uh, the embarrassing fact, I have to say, is that aside from Stanford University, every job that I ever had, I was fired from. So I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, you know, for IBM and Sun, especially for IBM, the idea for them was we must be doing well because we can afford to hire this peacock, <laughs> Dick Gabriel, and show him off. So Kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> That's a fascinating insight into, into the way certain companies work. Um, so I think I wanted to finish on a question about conferences because uh, obviously you were you founded the Onward Conference, which is, I think, my favorite conference uh, in the world. So uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, and uh, that's not all you've been involved with. Um, you run a little series. I don't know wh whether you ever do another RPG, but I've always enjoyed the RPGs. 
that you have uh, done in the past that I've managed to attend. Um, so do you see any particular risks or opportunities in the present disruption that conferences are going through? I actually, my faith in virtual conferences has been slightly restored by this uh, our conversation just now because I really enjoyed it and I wasn't uh, I was a bit stressed about it. So, uh, but do you see any 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 way to go that could that could bring something positive about how we do conferences? Uh, so, for the audience who who doesn't know, RPG stands for Richard's Pretty Good Talks. Uh, I will always do one if someone asks me to do it. Okay. So, someone has to invite me to do that. Uh, I have a habit of of creating or curating conferences. So all the uh, Plop conferences. I was designer for that. Uh, the programming conference that you know about. I was one of the designers of that. Uh, turning Oopsla into Splash was part of the onward sort of thing. So the disruption, as we talked about before coming on the air, I'm hoping will cause the technology to become uh, usable by humans. So better Zooms and things like that. I was surprised that the talks at PLEI that I did listen to, I didn't listen to too many, seemed to be better prepared than the live versions. So that was good. Being able to reach a lot more people, having the cost be uh, lower, having uh, not having to travel is a good thing. Um, missing the face-to-face, is, is hard to retrieve that. Um, so I'm kind of in the same boat you're in, which is I'm skeptical, but I see that there might be some hope because this, this turned out to be a little better than, than I thought it was going to be. Um, I think the, the important thing is to, for me, the important thing is to create paths for people who feel like they don't quite have enough gazorch to make it big time in, in the particular scientific field to feel like they can make good contributions. So students, uh, the outliers, uh, I mean, the whole point of Onward was to <clears throat> open up a publication venue for people in different parts of the yep. sort of life cycle of, uh, of research. So to that extent, you know, seeing people who can attend from African countries, et cetera, never would be able to do that before, I think is that's the uh, that's what you have to try to uh, make possible for more people. Right. Great. And that's a great thought. Uh, I think we should use that as a thought to end on. This has been an absolute treat. I really enjoyed myself and I hope it's been fun for you too. And for all the people watching and uh, contributing questions, thank you for all of those. Um, that was great. So I hope that uh, we've all enjoyed ourselves and there'll be more Ask Me Anything sessions uh, later on in PLDI as well. So thanks to everyone.